What I'd like to do uh, to start out is actually uh, uh, start with uh, Judge Rice. He, he, he is the, uh, without question, the father of reentry in Montgomery County and, and uh, uh, brought the issue to Commissioner Lieberman uh, shortly after taking office in 2004. Uh, we've come a long way since then in the, in the last eight years, uh, but I think you'll also hear uh, some, some information about the speed of government and how challenging it is to take on a, a broad uh, community issue like this and, and find success. So uh, I will turn it over to Judge Rice. Well, thank you. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. I'm, can you all hear me? Very good. Um, you know, there are a lot of myths in our society. One of the biggest is once you have served your sentence, the slate is wiped clean. You have paid your debt to society, and life goes on for you. Uh, that is a myth. It's a myth because once you're released from prison, unless you're very, very lucky to have employable skills, family support, you soon find that the debt is never paid. You find that uh, uh, access to employment, social services, and housing are shut uh, firmly and loudly uh, in your face. You find that you are greeted as uh, strangers by your family and friends to whom you have become a stranger. With all of the barriers, with all of the obstacles in the way of people returning from prison, it's not surprising that so many reoffend again and go back to prison. There are statistics all over uh, the lot on this, but I think it's safe to say that uh, within three years of release, some two-thirds of persons released either reoffend and are sent back to prison or reoffend and uh, perhaps uh, wind up under supervision in the community. And frankly, those who do not reoffend, who do not get involved in the criminal justice system after three years, many of them are condemned to live on the margins of society. Why did I get involved with reentry? Well, it's because after many years of doing uh, what I've been doing, I got tired of seeing the children and now, believe it or not, the grandchildren of people that I sentenced in the 60s and 70s coming into my uh, court. I got tired of uh, criminal conduct and recidivism uh, being passed down from generation to generation. I got tired of seeing basically decent people who have made some mistakes and who want to do the right thing, not being able literally to get off the ground as far as successfully reentering the community might be concerned and going back to prison again. So a few of us uh, decided that uh, one way to try to uh, prevent this revolving door between the community and prison, back into the community and then to prison once again, is to start an effort called successful reentry of ex-offenders back into the community. We felt at the time that it was a way to help people, to save people, to save families, to save children, to save neighborhoods, to save vast sums of money uh, from the criminal justice budgets in our community and statewide. And more importantly, perhaps, we sought to be a great method of achieving public safety. So much of our crime is committed by repeaters, by recidivists. And there was the feeling that if we could help those people to help themselves, that by definition would curtail the crime rate in any community. Well, we had some meetings, and although we thought the idea was a good one, we really didn't get off the ground until uh, we met with newly elected Commissioner Deborah Lieberman. This was in 
2005. Five, yes, yes, thank you. In January. And uh, it took her maybe about 20 seconds to seize upon this idea as one she would champion. Now, I've known a lot of public officials in my life, and uh, most public officials, it's safe to say, uh, do not want to tackle issues that will squander some of the popularity that they've gained through being elected as a public office holder. Most of them uh, prefer to tackle non-controversial issues, uh, such as, and there's nothing wrong with these issues, don't get me wrong, uh, such as uh, the arts, the opera, the ballet, uh, children's uh, issues, human services, and the like. But it's a rare elected office holder, it's a rare leader who seizes upon a topic like ex-offender reentry that she has to know uh, will not gain her any popularity, and as a matter of fact, may subject her to criticism from a very skeptical uh, public. But Commissioner Lieberman uh, stepped forward, and she has helped to spearhead this issue for a two-year study of the barriers facing ex-offenders to the point where we now have a community-wide policy board setting re-entry priorities for an office of ex-offender re-entry, which to this point, after two years, has served well over a thousand people with a recidivism rate that uh, I won't reveal, hopefully Joe or Jamie will, but it's one to stagger the imagination. And keep in mind that no matter how active the citizens were that wanted re-entry, it took a uh, fearless, and that's the word I use, leader in the person of Commissioner Lieberman to make it happen. I, I've learned two things in my years as a judge. First of all, there are very, very few bad people. Uh, I can count on the fingers of one hand the bad people I've met in well over 40 years. What there are would be a staggering number of basically good, decent people who for one reason or another have made some appallingly bad choices and have done some bad things. And if there's a way that we as the community can help them when they come home to help themselves, then uh, we can reunite them with their communities, with their families, with their children, and we can free up budgetary uh, sums to help rebuild our infrastructure, our schools, and the like, and we can increase public safety immeasurably. Our motto is that no one from Montgomery County will ever return to prison and be able to say, be able to legitimately say, I came home from prison, I wanted to do the right thing, but there was no one in the community to help me. They'll not be able to say that, to say it truthfully. John? Thank you, sir. As, as always, you uh, paint a, a dramatic picture. Uh, first of all, let me uh, say uh, Commissioner Lieberman very much wanted to be with us here tonight. Uh, she did have... Uh, uh, a conflict come up, and, and uh, uh, like Professor Apolito uh, mentioned, she's very approachable. If anyone would like to, to have some time with her, uh, please feel free to call her office, and she'd be happy to en engage on this issue or, or anything else that you'd like to talk about. Uh, I've had a, a very unique experience in, in working on reentry uh, since that first meeting in 2005. Uh, because I, I'm not only the policy uh, assistant for Commissioner Lieberman, but I'm her political assistant as well. And you can imagine that, that this was not the very first issue that I was uh, eager to see come up uh, uh, upon her taking office. Uh, but uh, what the judge described uh, really is a, a, a remarkable uh, approach that she took to, to this issue. Uh, and the, the time that it took to get to where we are today uh, was, was all very much part of that process. 
uh, that you you have to take very very small steps uh, when you're dealing with the, with a, a, an issue this broad, but also with the with the negatives that come along with it. Uh, one of the things I was really intrigued uh, to see uh, the the title of tonight, "Not in My Backyard." We hear that more and more, unfortunately. Uh, I uh, and a, as we developed the statistics and really started looking at the impact. Uh, of reentry on the community, it it made a lot of sense to get involved. It was it 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 was and, and remains a, a tremendous drain uh, uh, on the on the overall community. Uh, we're at about seventy four, excuse me, seventy four percent of the Montgomery County general fund budget goes to criminal justice services, and every penny that we can divert from that. Uh, it, for this program or other similar programs that uh, uh, move people away from from crime, uh, it is, has a positive impact on the overall community. Uh, but it was it was relatively early on when Commissioner Lieberman and I were at a, a community advisory uh, meeting, and uh, we had a very attentive audience, and everybody listened to what we had to say. And at, at that time. We didn't really have the personal side of it because we weren't dealing with uh, really dealing with ex-offenders. We were still dealing with it from a policy standpoint. So it was very statistically driven. Here's we have huge numbers of people returning to the community. We have this incredible. The judge said two thirds. It was actually almost 45 percent when we started looking at this in Montgomery County. 45 percent of the men and women returning from state prison were returning within three years. Uh, and we got to the end of our presentation, and a very reasonable woman in the, uh, who was part of this raised their hand and said, "How I, I hear what you're saying, but how can you put one ounce of energy or money behind this when there are hungry people in the community, when there are people who lack education, and, and, and on and on? And it really made us uh, step back and think about that. And it comes down to the fact that you are still, it's just as as impactful life that you're saving or that you're you're helping move to a positive path, uh, as it is any of those more uh, more socially acceptable uh, uh, programs that we we engage in. So so uh, uh, like uh, uh, Doctor or uh, uh, Professor Apolito said, it's it's very important that we think very much about these issues because it it's very easy to get on the wrong side of this without without trying too much and to be able to engage. Your fellow students and people in the community on these issues. Uh, I, I also uh, uh, spoke to uh, Professor Apolito about the policy side of things, and it's it's really very interesting because we went from a very small group of people engaged on this issue, and it really was the social service providers and the nonprofit directors who we first engaged it with, and as we broadened that through through a variety of means. Um, we got to the point of having a community-wide task force. There were over 300 people directly involved in the work of the reentry task force in Montgomery County. And when we finished with that process, uh, we did something really exciting, and it, it was another dynamic part of the leadership on this, is that, that the Montgomery County commissioners created a permanent policy board for reentry, so that no matter what happens to the funding, what happens to the office, whether it grows or it shrinks or, or grants get approved or, or they don't, we have a mechanism to continue to raise the issue of reentry in a permanent fashion in Montgomery County. And it, it is truly one of the keys uh, to how we move forward. Um, however, <laughs> in that policy board, we also found that we had a challenge. Because the Office of Reentry was started through a, uh, a state allocation of some stimul stimulus funds. And the office has continued through uh, applying and, and being successful in those applications for grants. So what that did was it really shrunk the amount of policy that our board could engage in because all of the grants were very uh, systematic. There were certain eligibility criteria, there were programming criteria, uh, and there were outcomes that had to be uh, 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 developed in order to uh, be successful in that. And of course, uh, most of you know that 
Uh, the one sure way to make sure you never get another grant dollar is to fail in your outcomes. So uh, we didn't have a whole lot for that policy board to get their, their hands around. And uh, fortunately, we're, we're actually at, uh, working on changing the funding model for that. And uh, so we'll have the opposite challenge of actually engaging on, on how we're going to, to structure the board and their funding. I'm going to, to look at things uh, more from a, a law enforcement perspective. And uh, uh, the reality is that there are just under 50,000 people in our uh, state prison system here in the state of Ohio. Over 95% of those individuals at some point will return to our community. Reentry not only encompasses the, the prison system, but it also pertains to people that are incarcerated in our county jail. Uh, across the country, 34,000 people are released from county jails uh, on a daily basis. That's 12 million jail releases per year. This is a question I ask uh, any number of groups that, that I speak to uh, about the jail population. Does anybody have any idea of what the population is of our county jail? How many inmates we have? Just shout it out if you have a guess. No guesses. <laughs> Pardon me? A uh, little high, a little high. Uh, fortunately, it's not that high. Um, uh, the, the typical answer I get is, is anywhere from 250 to 350 is what I normally hear. And, and that's from organizations that are quasi-criminal uh, 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 justice. Uh, actually, our current population is 791 uh, inmates. Uh, over the past 30 days, we've averaged 61 releases per day. And the average length of stay for 2012 in, of an inmate in the Montgomery County Jail is 51.95 days. Jail inmates face many of the same issues as those incarcerated at the state level. However, there are differences. Less time away from the family and friends. Jails offer, uh, uh, oftentimes are closer to home, allowing uh, greater uh, family interaction. Uh, ties to personal networks and support systems are not weakened to the extent normally found with prison inmates. We cannot expect these individuals to return to their communities, oftentimes to the negative environment that contributed to their incarceration to begin with, without assistance. Police, in most cases, locally view their role as exclusively in enforcers of the law. The relationship of the police to those in prison is to work to put them there. Police frustration, and, and I'll, this is the only comment that I will go back to uh, uh, regarding your professor and I. There was what we used to call double super secret probation. And, and that would upset us greatly. Uh, because we'd go out and arrest these people and the courts would see fit to put them on probation and it'd be probation on top of probation. Well, as, as you mature, and for your professor and I, that means get older, we, uh, we, we look at things differently. And, and uh, if you would have asked me 30 years ago if, if I was a supporter of reentry, my attitude would probably be somewhat different. But, but today, uh, fortunately, my, my attitude is what it is. And, and uh, uh, it's very essential that, that we work to change the attitude of, of not only law enforcement, but uh, other individuals of, of the criminal justice system. Uh, I'd like to take a look at the three strikes and your out concept for just a moment. If, uh, uh, it's the tough on crime approach. Uh, we, we've been working on a tough on crime approach for, for a number of years. And the criminal justice system in California is in terrible shape, uh, in part due to the three strike concept. Enacted in March of 1994, it had the following impact. In less than a year from the time the law enacted, thousands of cases were being prosecuted. 
fewer guilty pleas by defendants, <coughs> which mean more trials. If a person's going away for life, they're not going to plead guilty. They're going to want to take their, their chances with a trial. What, what do they have to lose by doing that? Absolutely nothing. This caused a backlog in the court system. Increase in persons held in county jails awaiting trials. Overflow of population. Increase in jail security. In October of 1994, and keep in mind this law passed in March of 1994, the County of Los Angeles alone provided an emergency budget appropriation of $10.2 million for the prosecution, public defense, and detention of persons charged under three strikes. The worst part is that 70% of those persons incarcerated under the three strike law during that period of time were incarcerated for nonviolent offenses, non-serious offenses. Fortunately, Proposition 36 passed this past November 6th and uh, they are redefining the three strikes law. So uh, you'll, you'll see some differences there. Locking people up and throwing away the key is not the answer. Police attitude is that the responsibility for returning prisoners to the community is that of probation and parole, not them. The role as viewed by prosecutors and most judges, not all, is not much different than that. Ex-offender reentry efforts should be viewed as a crime prevention effort. Many law enforcement agencies continue to provide DARE officers in schools. DARE has been proven to be ineffective in several uh, nationwide studies, yet because of community perception, because of, of positive uh, uh, attitude of, of the community toward the police for conducting the D.A.R.E. program, they continue to do it, even though we know it's ineffective. Reentry oftentimes is not viewed fair, favorably by the public, especially as it pertains to drug-related crimes. It's seen as a choice, and they made the wrong choice, that being the offender, so the outcome is on the individual. Why should we spend tax dollars on reentry efforts? The judge, I think, clearly answered that. Reentry is a tough sell, but we, uh, in order to succeed in this effort, have to sell it in order to reduce recidivism. Um, as the manager of the Montgomery County Office of Ex Offender Reentry, um, I am elated that my personal and professional passion um, are in, a, in alignment. And I say that. Um, to say this. I started in this, uh, the corrections profession when I was 21 years old. Um, I worked at Warren Correctional Institution for 16 years in various capacities. Um, I started off as a food service coordinator in that kitchen telling people how to cook, what they needed to do, you know, how many patties you need to put on that plate and how many scoops of mashed potatoes you needed to put on there and portion control and all of that. And I thought that was the best job at 21. I was getting paid pretty good, you know, at 21 doing that. And I thought, I need to do something better. So I said, well, let me go into unit management. I had some clerical skills and, um, you know, in high school I'd taken typing and all that. And I said, well, let me take this to another level. Um, went and I was actually unit secretary for about three years. Um, worked for the deputy warden for um, about six months, and then said, I need to do something more. And I was able to have the opportunity to work as a case manager um, at Warren Correctional Institution. And I did that for about three years. I said, I want something more. I had that three-year itch. You notice it's every, about every three years. It was something else. I needed, I needed something else. Um, and that led to the opportunity to work in a pilot unit. It was an AOD, alcohol and uh, drug, um, literacy residential unit um, at Warren Correctional Institution. Um, I did that for about a year and a half, so I broke the three-year mold. But then 
stepped back into the unit management as a unit manager and was a unit manager of over 500 adult male inmates for, for six years. So at Warren Correctional, you know, Warren Correctional Institution was one of the foundations um, that brought me, and one of the things that Judge mentioned before was um, looking at individuals in the courtroom, sons, fathers, you know, uncles, nephews. I looked at that every day. I saw a cousin combination, a, a twin brother combination, a, a son and a father, a grandson and a grandfather. When you begin to see that combination and that, that generational um, uh, repeat itself, you want to be on the hopeful side of the fence. And so right around 2005, the opportunity um, came open to step into a position with the Adult Parole Authority as a regional reentry specialist. And so I took that, um, that opportunity, not really knowing what to expect, but I wanted to be on the hopeful side of the fence. Although I was, I felt every day instilling hope in each and every individual that I came into contact with behind the fence. But wanting to be in the community, I, I actually had the opportunity to travel six counties. It was Hamilton County, Montgomery, Green, Miami, uh, Miami Preble. I had Clark as well. Um, and I was able to travel these counties and assist those parole officers in transitioning those ex-offenders into the community um, for about five years. And then I got that itch again. I need to do something. And guess what? I happened to, right around 2008, be involved in a community-wide ex-offender reentry task force here in Montgomery County um, and was on the pre- and post-relief services team. And really um, were able to identify those pre-release services and post-release services that were so critical to ex-offender reentry and the opportunity came open to become the manager of the Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry. And so here I stand. I believe that every second, every minute, every hour, day, um, every week, and every year prepared me for this today. Um, you have to have a passion, a very strong passion to do this work. Um, as Mr. Spittler said, it's very hard. It's hard sell. There's a lot of people, and many people may be right here sitting in this room that does not feel that we should be spending one dime on an ex-offender. And let me challenge you for those of you that feel this way. Um, with us tonight, we have brought um, several copies of our blueprint for reducing recidivism in Montgomery County. And for those of you I like to challenge, make sure you get a copy of this before you leave. And look at the third page, and I want to just take a moment, and I'd like to um, read this. The name of, uh, this is called A Note to Victims, and it was created by the Montgomery County um, Ex-Offender Entry Task Force. And it's very important because it's the reason why we do what we do. Ex-offenders come in many different shapes and sizes. In fact, there is a great variety in the nature of the crimes they've committed. These crimes often produce profound wounds in their victims, who are our parents, our spouses, siblings, children, friends, and neighbors. These crimes off the Montgomery County community-wide ex-offender reentry task force Members spent significant time contemplating the impact of these crimes and the glaring fact that they were committed by the very people we aim to serve through this initiative. The Reentry Task Force wishes to formally acknowledge the impact that these crimes have had not, not just on the victims themselves, but their families and sometimes their entire communities. Some of these crimes have created unpleasant and sometimes atrocious situations that the victims had to succumb to and endure at the hands of the offenders. 
And for this, the reentry task force wishes to express their sincere compassion and empathy to all people who have been victimized. The recommendations in this report are in no way meant to minimize the impact these crimes have had on the victims. We simply choose forth to put forth efforts that will make our homes, our neighborhoods, and communities a safer place to live for future generations and to assure that these crimes will significantly dec decrease over the coming years. So we serve the population of individuals that maybe have taken so much away because we want to increase public safety. We want to reduce victimization within the community. In order to do that, you can't avoid the issue and you can't avoid the root of the problem. You have to address it. You have to encourage and motivate the change in individuals that are willing and want to come to the table, willing to help themselves to change. If we don't advocate for that, what are we saying about you know, how we're impacting public safety? Are we going to be able to reduce it? We don't change the mindset of an individual that feels and has a value in their mind that what's yours is yours, uh, you know, what, my, what yours can be mine. You know, um, we have a, what we call an ORAS assessment. It's a Cincinnati-based validated um, risk assessment that we use to determine whether ex-offenders are low risk, moderate, high, or very high risk of reoffending. And one of the questions is, um, have you ever heard of the statement, do unto others before they do unto you? And what do you feel about that? And we get all kinds of answers, don't we, Mike? Based on how an individual answers the questions, and this is a 45 minute, 45 minute to one hour assessment, um, will determine whether an individual is very high risk and have maybe, you know, challenged values about life and their lives and how it relates into, you know, everyday um, daily activities within the community and how they relate to them and how they handle and respond to them. And so it is our responsibility as the Office of Reentry, myself, Amy, Mike Quinn has um, been a partner of ours, and he'll talk in a minute as well. But it is our um, responsibility to be advocate, advocates for change. Um, the Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry is located in the Job Center. Um, so if you know of anyone that can be, um, can utilize the help um, services, programs and services that we offer, um, then please send them our way. Uh, we are in room 104. Um, we all, it's called the Welcome One Stop Reentry Center. We make people feel welcome. We want people to know that when you walk through those doors, that everything that we say, you know, our motto, action, alliance, and accountability, those three A's, we expect action of the individuals that come through our doors. Don't just tell us that you're going to change. We want to see the change in you. We want you to align yourself with the network that we provide for you and the services, the resources, the partners that we connect you with. And we also want you to be accountable and invest in your own personal success. So it's impo important as, um, as an office that we operate and that we work, work, our work ethic is about action, alliance, and accountability. And we expect the same of those who walk through our doors every day. Um, it was mentioned about the recidivism, and I want to touch on that for just a, just a moment. Um, when we were, as a community-wide task force, uh, looking at recidivism in Montgomery County, we were right, ar right around 44%. And that's high. So that means that 44% of the individuals that were released within three years, they returned back behind prison walls. That was around 2008 that we were taking, use it, utilizing those individuals that had been released from 2006, three years later, and in 2008 that was 44%. Well, um, about 2010 we were right around 36%, and just last year we're now down to 32.1%. So it's going in the right direction. And I believe that it's because of the awareness that is being um, 
um, you know, the awareness of reentry, reentry measures, and the opportunity for individuals to make the change. The Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry has had three main, um, should I say, grant-based programs. We started off with the Montgomery County Reentry Project. Um, we served uh, just over 800 individuals in that project. Um, about 80 of those individuals have returned to prison in the last two years. That's about 10%. That's not really bad. You know, when you look at our partnership with East End Community Service Pathways Out of Poverty, we provided the ORS assessments. We determined those that were at low risk of reoffending, low to moderate, and we referred those individuals to the East End Project. We also provided consultant uh, case management services for those individuals. And, and so when you look at that, just a little over 30 of those individuals out of three, uh, over 300 had returned to prison. So again, we're just, just, just under 10% there. And then we also look at our current project, which is the ACTS, Advanced Cognitive Treatment Services Study Project. Um, 89 individuals served, and we have uh, four individuals that have um, been arrested and re returned. So that's right around 6%. So now we're looking at um, about an average of 9% recidivism for those individuals that were served through the Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry. I say that's pretty good. And hello again to everybody. Again, my name is Amy Piner. I am one of the program coordinators in the Office of Reentry. Um, the thing that led me to the office was I have an extensive background in the legal field as a whole. I started out um, in more of the corporate setting, working at LexisNexis for a number of years, and then entered into the court system, well, actually did private um, law firms for a while, and then entered into the court system and went through um, the jury services area, the case management area, and then most recently before joining the office, I was a pre-sentence investigation office, officer. And that's what ignited my uh, passion even more for wanting to do this work. As a pre-sentence investigation officer, my job was primarily to spend about 15 minutes interviewing a client, um, do an assessment of their criminal background, their family history, and then some other components, and then write up a recommendation on whether that person should receive community control supervision or whether there was a recommendation that justified um, requesting that they go to prison. So in that capacity, we never really had the time or were never challenged really to be able to work with individuals to help do some things on a positive note before they were sentenced to any kind of um, alter whatever their sentence outcome was. And so I saw the opportunity with the Office of Reentry to really make more of an impact on clients who found themselves on the other side of that. For years, I spent time, like I said, from the law firm side and the court side, I was really on the other side of it. So now this gave me an opportunity to really work one-on-one -on -one with clients that were facing those challenges. Um, as John mentioned, our funding sometimes comes from various grant sources. And Jamie mentioned that one of our programs we call our ACTS program. Um, over the past year, I've had a lot of involvement in helping write some of our grant applications. But most recently this year, I'm actually um, more so the coordinator over the ACTS program. So I'm the one that works day to day with the clients who are selected to participate in that program. The program targets uh, moderate and high, and high risk clients. And then we go through random selection process that we work through Wright State University to do. Um, and once the, the person has been selected for the program, they then enter a 10-week um, curriculum with our office where they're getting a number of different things. They get the basis of the research grant was about cognitive intervention. So they get pure cognitive things like thinking for a change. Any of the programs that are then taught in our curriculum also have a cognitive base, which means it has to be interactive. It has to be more than a lecture. They have to be able to inter in engage with the facilitator, actually do some role modeling, and just a number of different components. At the end of that 10 weeks, they then receive a number of certificates for various components that they've completed. And throughout the 10-week curriculum, they also receive a weekly stipend. If they're moderate risk, they receive $30 a week. If they're high risk, they receive $40 a week. 
but those stipends are based on whether or not they actually completed their time for the week. So as we do that, um, we're able to then give them some funds that they, uh, many of them choose to actually save their funds and use it as a means to build towards something so that at the end of the 10 weeks, they know that they've got some stable income for a little bit. Um, how many of you have a debit card or any kind of card that has your name on it? Imagine not having that. For many of our clients, when they come through this program, they receive a card with their name on it. And some of them, this is the first time in their life that they've ever had that type of resource available to them. So consider yourself really fortunate in that sense. Um, I'll borrow from the words of um, the director that we hear from the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, who always says, but by the grace of God, there go I. And so if we think about that, when we've had, if we really examine ourselves, have we had friends or loved ones or anybody who's been in trouble in the legal system before, and just imagining that, it, that at the end of your education, and we know some of the things that go on now and the challenges that we all have with employment, but imagine finishing school and now not even having a chance, even with your degree, because of a felony on your record for some reason, and sometimes for a very small reason. So those are the kinds of things that drive us to do what, they, what we do. And then on the last note, I'll say to you, imagine having... Uh, been 12 years old, never having a relationship with your father, and losing your mother at that age, what would your life look like right now? Would many of you be able to survive and be where you are today? Those are the kinds of clients that we help in our program on a daily basis. And it, it is very rewarding to be able to help someone who has had to overcome those type of obstacles in their life to now be a full-time student in Sinclair community college, which is just one step along the path of trying to create more of a positive impact on his life. So on that note... Um, my name is Quinn Howard, and I am uh, currently a case manager uh, with Arbor Education and Training Youth Services over at the Job Center. I am a facilitator with um, a, a program out of uh, Springfield Urban Light Ministries where I do uh, facilitate a responsible fatherhood program. Uh, at our STOP program um, here in Dayton, which is the Secure Transitions Offender Program for Probationers. I'm a volunteer with the Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry, uh, where I will fill in and do our VIC, because I'm certified in, uh, by the state of Ohio uh, to facilitate victim awareness uh, uh, training. And also, I'm a self-proclaimed uh, facilitator for collateral sanctions. Uh, that's one of my... Um, one of the things that I, I really, um, you know, I have, have taken on and I, I really am endeared to, uh, you know, uh, uh, just am really passionate about that uh, particular topic. And over the years I have uh, done presentations and I've updated information and, and so forth in regards to that. Uh, I was program coordinator for uh, Goodwill Transitional Jobs Employment Program, which, of which we partnered with the Montgomery County Office of Ex-Offender Reentry. Transitional Employment Program is uh, that component of the program was for employment services to assist those individuals in getting them some short-term temporary employment through the, uh, through the grant, of which was very successful. Um, I'm a mentor for a fatherhood youth program called Men of Standards. That program, uh, the, uh, the, the other uh, mentors along with myself, we go out to see the youth at uh, Circleville Prison which is a youth prison out uh, south of uh, Columbus. We go out there once a month to uh, take programming into those, uh, those young men in, the, uh, in that youth prison. Uh, now, how do I qualify myself to speak about uh, prisoner reentry? Let me tell you the, the real story. Well, I actually served time in Texas Department of Criminal Justice, uh, felony drug conviction. And I served, I didn't do a lot of time, but it was enough time. And I was released in 1996. I came back to Dayton. Um, I'm a single father, so my kids were real little at the time. Uh, thank God they were off in college, sitting in seats just like you now. Um, I worked a job for nine straight years from 1997 to 2006. Uh, I needed a job because I had to pay the child support. And a lady 
at a retail establishment out in Beaver Creek gave me an opportunity because I was honest about, uh, about my background. And she gave me an opportunity and I was dedicated to that job for nine straight years. Within that time, I went back and got my bachelor's degree. After having been told that I couldn't get uh, financial aid, so I actually called financial aid and got the truth about that. You can't get financial aid with a felony conviction. Um, so I, and I also completed my master's degree, MBA in business, master's in business administration. Now, I got involved with reentry in 2006 after working on this job for nine years, I was exploring other opportunities, and I applied for a job with a uh, with the national uh, bottler. Uh, I'm not going to call call the uh, call the name of the company, but make a long story short. After going through all, applying for the job, going through the assessment test and everything, they turned me down for the job, and they told me that it had it was just because of my felony conviction. They did not take a look at the past nine or ten years in terms of all the accomplishments that I had, um, had, had achieved, um, my educational background, or any of that. It was solely on the fact that I was a, fe a convicted felon. So then it was that point where I said something needs to be done. I need to get involved to speak out for those individuals who did not have the educational experience that I had, did not have the work experience that I had, so what would they be going through? Somebody that gets out that didn't have a GED, high school diploma, no work experience. So I got involved with reentry in the community, uh, being involved with conferences, workshops, getting on committees. Um, I can remember meeting Jamie G back um, around that time, and we were going around doing the uh, citizen circles and stuff, and uh, I just stayed around. And, um, but I just wanted to make a difference. Um, and so that's, that's, that's why I'm involved with this. And I want to say uh, that I didn't have a reentry program coming when I came home. I just had to, you know, uh, be sure that I didn't want to do whatever it was that got me there. So I, I'd stay dedicated. But, you know, thank God that there is a reentry program and thank God for the support of so many of, uh, you know, the people in our community that are sincere about that. And, uh, and it's real important because we need it. Um, it's, it doesn't, there's not a day that goes by uh, if I'm out at the grocery store or the gas station a restaurant where someone doesn't come up to me that's been in uh, a workshop or come through our program uh, that says thank you. Hey, can I get another, can, Quinn, can you help me find another job? Is there any uh, other services that we can get? You know, and, and uh, so it's real important, like your instructor was saying, if you don't want to help some uh, help some people out that uh, the opportunities are there. And uh, so with that, uh, and I also just thankful for some new stuff that has come back, come down with uh, Senate Bill 337 and House Bill 86. Um, and Jamie's going to have got some information on that if you want to take a look at that later. But uh, reentry is possible. I'm an evidence of that. And I know if I'm evidence that people can change, that of change, then I know others can change. How you guys doing? My name is Mike Ward, program coordinator operations for the office and um, really glad to be here a year just went by so quickly because we were here last year and it's exciting seeing uh, the people who are really interested yet that you're here tonight uh, I come here by way of um, having been incarcerated uh, having done time back in the 80s and um, uh, just seeing the programming that was available internally within the institution and coming home and not there was nothing really much available and then but seeing you know that there were opportunities in both the public and private sector but it really depends on the individual and what the individual is willing to do and yesterday it all came into uh, to a head for me yesterday I was doing a eulogy at a friend of mine's uh, actually he's my older cousin uh, his funeral was yesterday and I remember uh, he was in his mid-twenties and I was maybe 12, 13, and he took me to, uh, to a meeting uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. And he had uh, came home from Vietnam. And he said, well, we're going to change the community. And uh, we're going to have a revolution in the community. And I'm like, okay, what is he talking about? You know, I'm, uh, 
And my mom said, well, yeah, you can take him. Go ahead and take him. Just don't let anything happen to him. So I'm just a 12, 13-year-old. And so we're in Cleveland. And um, he says, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to clean up the community. We're going to no more drug selling in the black community, no more prostitution, no more violence in the community. I'm like, How's he, how are you going to do this? You know, it's, it's, it's happening all over the community. Well, he, did, he forgot to tell my mom that they were going to be armed and they were going to run all the pimps and the prostitutes and the drug dealers out of the community. And um, that night, that's what went down. People, the pimps were getting beat up, they ran off the street corners, and uh, I didn't know that there was this movement in the community where there were maybe a couple hundred people saying no more drug dealing, no more pimping, no more prostitution, not in this strip, not in this block, and that didn't go down very well, but it went down and people were patrolling the community with shotguns and saying, we told you no more drug sales here. We told you no more prostitution here. And it lasted maybe three or four years. But then it came back. And when it came back, when the prostitution came back, and when the drug sales came back, it came back even stronger, even heavier, with even a, more of a commitment. Uh, because the people who started, who just came home from Vietnam, they had all gotten older. Uh, there were no more jobs. Some of them ended up in prison. Some of them ended up selling drugs themselves. And so there was this internal conflict within our community that, like, well, hey, you either in or you out. But it was the first thing, you know, that the first time that we ever dealt with something saying, not in my backyard. And, and at that time, we were saying, or the older men were saying, who had just came home from Vietnam, who were not strung out on heroin, not in our backyard will you do prostitution or sell drugs anymore. And that was the first internal conflict that we had within the black community. And we lost big time. But I was a kid, I really didn't understand what we had lost until I had gotten older. But I, it took me to a point when I was reading his eulogy how much he really believed that internally within our community, we should stop the drug dealing ourselves. We should stop the prostitution and, and, and the pimps from uh, uh, commercially, sexually exploitating the young people you know, in our community, that we should be the first line of defense. Uh, and he really believed that with all of his heart. He never changed on that, not one bit. So when I told him, I said, well, hey, I think I found a better way to do <laughs> Uh, a better way to do reentry or, 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 or to change within the community. I said, we need help. I said, um, you know, this is what I'm doing now. And so he said, well, you mean they're actually helping? I said, yeah, we have a federal judge and we have commissioners and, and the, the universities are getting involved in helping to change the community and, and, and making the community a safer place. He said, no. He said, I can't believe that. I really can't believe that. He said, because Usually they're the ones, you know, that, 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 that we had to uh, fight against. I said, no, I said, it's completely changed. I said, the, both in the public and private sector, there's a buy-in now. You know, they see the reason, you know, to come and help us now to really change the community at the university level, at the court level, uh, within the law enforcement level. These are, are, this is a new day. This is a new time. It's a different kind of revolution. And, and now we got people, a whole network, you know, that we can steamroll right through the community. I said, what we did in Southside Chicago, through ceasefire, we, we, we were able to go and say, hey, a free, a free safety zone uh, within a school district, four blocks in each area, and made it a safety zone. No pimping, no prostitution, no drug sales, but you got an agreement to do those things in the bigger cities like Southside Chicago. But what's happening here now, having the University of Dayton, federal judges, county commissioners, uh, 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 the Ohio Department of Corrections coming together and doing reentry like this because reentry really is that first line of defense now in our community. It says you don't have to rob. You don't have to do those things anymore unless you want to. And then, yeah, we do have a bed for you at ODRNC. You know, but if you want to stay in the community, this is what we're going to do in the community. I know that sometimes uh, my boss, Jamie G, says to me, Mike, 
Now, I don't want you to say that, but sometimes I, I can't help it. I'm, I, if I have an audience and I'm talking with uh, some guys that I may have done time with or people that I haven't done time with, and I'll tell them, hey, if you're not ready to help participate, to be a good citizen, to do what's right, to vote, to help people out, then ask the director of the Department of Corrections, can you stay? Because we don't need you back in the community if you're not going to come and help. You know, if you're not going to come and help us out, you're not going to come and be there with us as a volunteer or an active citizen, stay within the institution. We need every person that we can get to be on that front line, you know, with us. And that's one of the main reasons why we're here tonight, because we're going to need you're young, you're enthusiastic, and you really don't know yet, so that's really why we want to grab you now. So we can break you in and get you out there and volunteer in our office, volunteer in the community, because that's what we want. You know, we want the people that are really interested in helping. And I learned a lot when I worked with a lot of people in Peace Corps in West Africa. They were the greatest people. I used to say, why are you here living out in the village with no water and no electricity? And they said, because we want to make a difference. We want to make a change. And uh, we're here to see that through. And so when we would dig the, w the wells in the village, you know, and I'm like, man, you guys, I love you guys. You guys are committed. You know, and that's what we're looking for, people who are committed and dedicated. Because the most committed and dedicated win, because there's people out there, they're just as committed and dedicated, but I think we can beat them, hands down. You know, we just need you guys to be able to do that. Uh, we'd really love to, to hear your questions and your thoughts and, and see if we can... Uh, uh, provide any uh, uh, insight, uh, any uh, issues you're struggling with. So, so please. Uh, yes, uh, the question was, what do we see as the uh, future of, of corrections uh, in Montgomery County? Uh, there's been a, a tremendous movement uh, within all of the elected officials in Montgomery County to really help uh, work together to control the, the jail, the local jail population. Uh, it, when you look back just a couple of years ago, uh, we were sending out, we had so many people incarcerated in the local jail that we were sending out uh, hundreds of people costing millions of dollars a year uh, to other, other jails. And by working together and really focusing on the people who need to have that level of incarceration, using uh, electronic home detention, uh, using diversion programs, all kinds of different things. We are actually a model. Somebody was mentioning uh, uh, House Bill 86. It's one of the uh, cr uh, criminal justice reform bills that the state of Ohio has passed. Uh, in some part, was modeled on the idea about really evaluating each individual as to what their level of incarceration was needed and, and what level of programming could be done uh, to help uh, put people back on a positive path. So I think that that's what we're going to see is a continuation of those programs, a continuation of that effort now on a statewide basis uh, uh, to really minimize incarceration both from a state standpoint and a local standpoint across the state. Uh, uh, Your Honor, Joe? I think uh, you can broaden the question to the future of corrections uh, throughout the country. Uh, there is a realization that the way we have been doing things, building more prisons, requiring more and more people to go to prison for lengthy sentences, simply doesn't work. A, it's bankrupting us. B, it's destroying a generation or two of persons. Uh, frankly, it falls harshest on the minority members of our community. And three, it causes more crime than it can ever hope to prevent or curtail. I think that is a national awakening at this time. And uh, I would think that uh, with varying degrees of intensity and rapidity, the future of corrections is trying to address what brings a person into criminal court in the first place. And while protecting the community, helping that person, if he or she wants to be helped, to address those issues, to overcome those barriers, so that that person can be a productive, tax-paying citizen. That will, uh, as I said earlier, preserve families, neighborhoods, communities, reduce crime, 
uh, save countless dollars in community budgets, and at the same time uh, assign to prison uh, those relatively few people who in fact are a danger to society and must be kept uh, away uh, from the community. So I think it's a national awakening, not just Montgomery County. I think uh, a lot of the efforts that, that are being put forth uh, uh, locally will uh, help us in, in reducing the jail population and uh, as we move forward. Uh, uh, I, I serve as Director of Criminal Justice for Montgomery County and as part of that I serve as Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Council. And we have a subcommittee that, that is looking at standardizing arrest policies uh, within the county. Uh, we, we meet with uh, a number of police chiefs to try and come up with, with the best policies that relate to, to arrest of individuals, those people that need to be incarcerated versus those that can be summonsed into court uh, as opposed to, to being locked up. And uh, we, we've not sent anybody out to be housed at another institution since April of uh, 2008. So uh, what we're doing is, is, is working to an extent. Uh, but, but as the judge indicated, this, this is much bigger than just Montgomery County. And uh, uh, steps are being taken uh, across the country to, to uh, uh, and specifically across the state uh, as far as reentry efforts go. And uh, that, that is really the, uh, the wave of the future that, that will help us uh, control the prison population uh, that, that uh, for so long has been out of control. And, and along with that is making sensible laws. Uh, there, there has been a, a number of laws that, that have been revised. There, there's still some other things that need a lot of work, but uh, uh, we've come a long way in, in a relatively short period of time in that regard. There is a very sizable percentage of persons in the community that are skeptics, that uh, believe that uh, people who have committed crimes made the choice to do so. They've made their own bed, now let them lie in it. These are people who feel that uh, once a criminal, whatever that is, always a criminal. Uh, the reason why we have such draconian sentencing laws, the reason why more and more people are required to go to prison, not only in Ohio but everywhere, is because the community is fearful. Fearful of uh, crime from random uh, strangers and because the legislature hears from those people and until very recently did not hear from those who believe that people can be helped, the legislators pass uh, these draconian sentencing laws. So what we have to do, and hopefully you'll help us in this endeavor, is to go to members of the community, sit down with them, and explain to them why reentry is a win-win for everybody. And you know, it's nice to have people with fancy titles and pedigrees uh, making these statements, but people will yawn and uh, uh, tune us out. What really convinces people that this is an effort that can work to everybody's benefit is someone who has gone through the system, who has decided to do things in the right way and has made it, and who is an absolutely solid citizen, absolutely indistinguishable, if you look at them, from any one of us uh, here. So uh, that's my answer. We have a terrific selling job uh, to do with the public, but uh, what we are trying to sell, I think, is uh, a win-win for everyone if we can just get to enough people. In addition to that, I'd just like to add a little. Uh, one, um, one area, and of course you can imagine that this is not consistent at all, 
but uh, there are employers out there that have had very positive experiences hiring ex-offenders. And they are one of the most important elements of, the, uh, of, of moving this whole uh, uh, concept forward in the community. And as part of that, and, and with some, uh, some pressure from uh, some parts of, of the community also, Montgomery County this last summer uh, uh, took the step of, of what's generally called banning the box, uh, which is to remove the, the felony, uh, have you been convicted of a felony question, from our job application. And we, we did that, and a number of other communities across Ohio are, are taking that step. Uh, the city of Dayton is working on it as well. Uh, and, of course, we've gotten positive and negative feedback on that. Uh, but uh, what it really does is it allows us to work together with those employers who've had these positive experiences to work with the balance of the private sector employment world. Because, like Quinn uh, described, uh, uh, I know we all up here have heard uh, stories of people who've been out for 20 or 30 years and never had a misstep, but they might find themselves back in the employment hunt, and it's like they just got out of prison. And it's such a huge part of really starting to change perception uh, it is to, to get to, to work with those employers and the groups uh, like Montgomery County that, that have taken this step to really show the positive side of hiring ex-offenders and, and taking that risk. And like, again, again like Quinn said, uh, you know, the, the number one key from, the, re, from the, the returning citizen is that honesty, owning their, their, their background and, and what they've done and what they've done to change their lives. But then there's the other side of the coin where we all have to work together to show that this is a very positive step. You can do all of this stuff, but if people don't have jobs, they're never going to make it in the long run.